All right, all right, all right, folks. Welcome to another edition of Zentegra's webinar Wednesdays. We got a great topic today. We're going to talk about Office 365 and you know how you can optimize your experience uh, leveraging a lesser known program called Fast Track. And today I got great guests on the phone and a lot of great content today. And and you know again, it's the beginning of the month. So guess what? If you've attended all of last month, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. And if you're net new to this uh, webinar, you'll you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. So uh, my name is Pete Downing. I'm the host of uh, Webinar Wednesdays. Uh, and unfortunately today, Trevor Manzel, who's gonna join us, he's our CIO and VP of our MSP, uh, is on vacation, a, a well-deserved vacation, um, but couldn't join us today. But I'm still joined by two awesome gentlemen, uh, Jody and Andy. So Jody, you wanna give yourself a quick introduction, please? Yeah, thanks, Pete. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Jody Elkins, and I'm the, the president of the Americas region of a company called Incentra. Uh, and Incentra is a 100% channel services organization. So, so what that means to you is that we only work and transact with uh, awesome strategic partners like Zintegra. Um, one of the things that we specialize in is the Microsoft stack, and, and we've been doing a couple of things for a number of years uh, around Office 365. So uh, just to put some context around that, we've, we've influenced the migration of, of over two and a half million mailboxes into Office 365 at this point, and, and greater than eight petabytes of, of our, uh, email archive migrations. So, so we've run into um, just about everything there is to run into. Uh, size of organizations that we support in those migrations range from literally SMB at less than 10 users, all the way to um, you know 200,000 user organizations. So there's a lot there, and we were originally uh, we were one of the original six fast track partners. So uh, those of you that know what fast track is, that'll mean something. Those of you that don't, uh, we'll get into that a little bit today and and, and help you understand uh, what that's all about. And uh, and that is an entitled program for you. So so yeah, that's uh, that's me and 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 in Centra. Cool. And uh, Andy, you want to give yourself a quick intro? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Pete. I'm Andy Sulak, Practice Manager for Incentra Americas, uh, and I run the uh, the technical teams, and I'm uh, joining to provide a little bit more uh, in-depth information on uh, <clears throat> the areas of Microsoft um, Office 365, or now Microsoft 365, which I'll mention in a little bit, as well as uh, migration uh, items and uh, where Exchange Server is going. So we, and Andy's, you know, a little modest. He's been in this industry a long time. As as of Jody, we we've known each other a long time. Uh, we've been bouncing around the end user compute in cloud industry for quite a while. Been friends, been competitors, and, and more. So it's been fun to interact with Jody and Andy over the years. Um, all right, just quick housekeeping. We are on go to webinar. Uh, for those who are returning, welcome back. Uh, for those who are net new, please ask questions in the Q and A dialog box. Uh, they do get tracked and we do pay attention to them. So if you have a question, shoot, we'll answer them. Uh, and if we get to the end and there's way too many questions, we try to follow up and answer any questions we couldn't get to at the end uh, post session. So definitely ask questions. Uh, and if for some reason you can't hear us, pop a, hey, I can't hear you in the Q&A, we try to pay attention, but you know, most, I'm assuming most everybody can hear us. Um, agenda, very simple flow, you know, we go through a quick introduction. I love polls. We're gonna ask some polls in a second. Then we go through and talk about the topic. And then we recap at the end on who is Zentegra and how is Zentegra and Incentra, uh, Incentra uh, working together. Um, now, if you already have it, bookmark this page, uh, Zentegra.com forward slash webinars. Uh, we got a great lineup of webinars coming up. Uh, I, am fine, I just finalized my list for September into October, if you can believe that. Uh, so a lot of great vendors, a lot of great topics. Uh, I'll definitely bookmark that page. Now, the reason why is uh, we are in the Q3 timeframe are doing what's called this Grubhub Team Lunch Giveaway. Um, and basically, uh, this is, you know, the, the way it works is if you register for any webinar between now and end of quarter, uh, so, you know, September uh, 31st, uh, you get put into a drawing for a Team Lunch Giveaway. But parallel, you also get credits towards your own personal uh, Grubhub use. Uh, so for every two webinars you attend in a month, you get uh, you know guaranteed 
$50 uh, Grubhub credits. And then if you attend all four in a month, you get some extra bonus. So again, that's highlighted in the email if you saw it. Uh, and if not, uh, you know, I try to do a nudge every few weeks about this uh, giveaway. Um, so for those who have who've attended all four, we'll be reaching out and, for last month. And for those who uh, are consistently been attending, yep, it's a new month. So guess what? It's reset and you get up to $50 per month uh, for attending. Um, Zentegra.com for such events. We have a lot of great events as well. So check out our events. We got everything from hands-on workshops to demo sessions to what I like to call mini workshops. Um, so definitely check those out. Um, and then finally, podcasts. Uh, we do uh, podcasts focused on the EUC community. Uh, Andy, our founder and CEO, loves to do uh, podcasts. He is currently uh, working on one that's called the Citrix Session, which is focused just on Citrix topics and blogs. Uh, we're about to launch a new one around VMware, and we're also working on another one that's going to be focused on Microsoft. So we got a lot of great content uh, coming your way. All right, I love to get the audience involved, and uh, <laughs> um, and I love to ask questions. So the first question is a warm-up question. All right, are you using uh, M365 technically, O365 uh, today? And I'm gonna put that poll out there. And for those who are on the web client, if you're on the web client, sometimes you full screen, you'll get the poll. Uh, it's finicky. I know. Unfortunately, I don't work for go to webinar slash log me in. Uh, but please take a moment to answer the poll. They are um, anonymous uh, and the data is not shared actively on the call with anybody. So it's all anonymous. So don't worry. Uh, user X can't see user Y, so on and so forth. Uh, so I'll give you guys a couple seconds to answer this. And we like to ask this just to understand, you know, the audience makeup. You know, every now and again, you might get someone who clicks Chrome. Uh, if we got one today, I'd, I'd kind of find that funny, but hey, you never know. Nothing wrong with Chrome Enterprise. I, I actually, you know, used it in a past life uh, with another company. So, all right, a couple more seconds. Last call for clicks. Going once, twice, and share. So we got a lot of folks actually using Exchange Online. So almost 40% of the, the the people on on today's webinar. But if you take and lump the first option, the third option uh, together, you're, you're as far as people who are still you know, on-premise and, and or still deploying. And that's kind of what we're gonna focus on today. And then for those in the no bucket, you know, we'll, we'll address some of that today and give you some good food for thought on things we can do to help you consider moving to Office 365. All right, the next poll is, Another simple one, more of an interest question than anything, but your my enterprise is evaluating or, or using Azure infrastructure as a service. So not you know SQL or BI or the infrastructure. So you're actually spinning up virtual machines in Azure and actually leveraging that. Um, and again, this is more of a anecdotal curiosity question, but it also plays into your O365 strategy. Uh, especially if you're looking at technologies like Citrix and WBD or VMware and WBD and or just VD, WBD, Windows Virtual Desktop natively. So, you know, without, you know, the investment in O365, you know, it kind of makes that adoption a little bit challenging. All right, a couple more seconds. Last call for clicks. Going once, twice, and final call. All right, so we got a good spread today. Um, so we got a lot of folks in the, yes, we are using it in production. And, uh, you know, it's almost like a third, third, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, um, so, you know, we got a bunch of folks evaluating it slash using a test lab. And I always target those folks. So if you're evaluating or using Azure in a test lab, definitely reach out. There's a lot of funding programs that we can help uh, get you funding to pilot things like WBD. Pilot, you know, Azure, what's what's called Azure Anywhere. Uh, so there's a lot of great options to get some monies, you know, dollars so that you're not spending your own money to pilot something. So definitely reach out. Uh, and if you're in the, the lower end of the bucket here, the no bucket, definitely, you know, put it in the back of your mind. Cloud computing, yes, I know a lot for a long time people are like, oh, I'm not doing cloud computing, but it's coming, it's here, and there is some validity to it. Now, if you're on AWS, awesome. We should have a conversation as well. And if you're on Google Cloud Platform, great. You know, let's have a conversation. 
All right, fun question. I am familiar with Microsoft Fast Track. And the answer honestly, like if you're if you're not, just say no. Um, and uh, you know that's what we're here to address today. Um, but if you are honest, if you are familiar with it and you're using it, say hey, yeah, we already used it or used it. Uh, but if you or would like to use it, um, and that helps us, so that way we understand the audience uh, structure here. So we'll give us a couple seconds to get some good answers here. And this is why I got the experts on the phone, Jody and Andy, today, because they're the experts in Fast Track uh, and all things getting you migrated from on premise to O365. So, all right, going once for, for uh, clicks, twice, and final call. All right, so I'm going to share this. And we got a lot of no's, so that's good. So we're gonna educate you. Now, the other thing we're gonna educate you on is on licensing. I'll spend a couple of minutes just going through licensing, just the level set, all right? Um, and just give you an idea of the different packages that are out there, et cetera, all right? All right, final question, fun question, and we're gonna address this in a little bit. Uh, is Microsoft Ex Exchange 2019 the last on-premise version? And pick your what you think is the right answer and there and again we're not going to disclose this answer because it really isn't black and white as andy will tell you um but just a little fun question to see what the audience thinks and we'll give us a couple seconds and we're gonna spend a little bit talking about this uh, before we jump into talking about fast track today uh it's gonna be fun so we'll give us a couple seconds going once Going twice and last call for clicks and done. All right, so we got a lot of true, and we got it's almost yeah, it's 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 funny to see this, but we will address this. And I think this this answer here shows that yeah, the answer is very gray still. Uh, so it's gonna be interesting to see, but we'll, we'll have a little conversation about that in a few minutes. All right, so thanks for playing. Uh, I love doing the polls because it helps us with not only data, but uh, also gives us some good anecdotal facts as we as we look into the industry as well. Um, all right, social media. If you're not following LinkedIn, uh, uh, Zentegra, uh, Centra, Microsoft on any of the social platforms, please do. Um, you know, there's a lot of great information that gets shared, especially on LinkedIn. If you're in the business sector or, you know, you're in the realm that we are in, LinkedIn seems to be the, the social norm now to to be able to you know, share information. Uh, YouTube, uh, we do put these uh, webinars up on YouTube uh, after a certain period of time. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll see an archive of all webinars that we've done over the last two years. Uh, pretty cool. Um, and you'll see that in centers on quite a few of them. So uh, they're, they're a frequent guest. Um, all right, so let's talk about Migration Blues and uh, you know Office 365 and how to optimize the, this experience. So before I do, I'm gonna jump into just a quick conversation around licensing. And the reason why I wanna do this is because I wanna level set you know, uh, just the playing field for a little bit and we're gonna address the, the, numbers, the numbers game around what is fast track and who, who actually you know, qualifies for that. And we'll address like, you know, if you don't qualify, what are your options, all right? So there's a lot of different options, especially if you're an, an SMB, right? So if you're a smaller business and you're looking at uh, OneDrive and O365 and 365, you know, there's the business uh, option uh, for any of the SMBs for, you know, 300 and under. Um, so if you're a smaller enterprise, you know, don't fret. There, there are options out there for you. And, you know, O365 is really good, great at trying to help optimize and streamline your experience. Um, now, you can also do add-ons. So there's a lot of great add-on features to anything you do uh, O365. Now, the great thing about this is if you are a smaller customer, you can actually transact through uh, Zentegra and what we call our Zentegra Connect business, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, and we can help you even migrate. Um, and then you have your, at the top, you have what's called Business Premium. And Business Premium um, is what's gonna allow you to uh, get the full stack. Uh, there's a bunch of different cloud services uh, included in that. And I'm gonna show the eye chart in a minute, so bear with me. Uh, so these are really the, the three core plans that exist for you know, what we call our SMB 300 and under. And why am I showing this is because you know, I, wanted, I, I want you know, anybody who's in the threshold that doesn't qualify for fast track, there still are options and we're gonna address that today. Um, so here you go, here's the 
the uh, three plans that I talked about. And, you know, I'll probably, I'll share these, these slides uh, post session um, just so you can have this, but um, you can see that there's a 300 seat cap for the, the what we call the SMB plans. And you, and you can see they come with quite a, a bit of options, okay? Um, and obviously the business premium is gonna give you the, I'll call it the more bang for your buck. Uh, you get the you know email exchange, you get the uh, online meetings, et cetera, but you also get the office apps, uh, your iPad and you know, smart phone management, office online. Um, and again, if you're a business who's like, you know what, I just need exchange and some of the cloud functions, that's where essentials comes into play and you're still paying for on-premises office, right? And, you know, yes, there's ways you have to install office if you're doing shared virtual machines, things like that. If you have questions about that, definitely reach out. Uh, I have documentation I can send you on how to properly install, you know, O365 in a shared environment. Um, now, if you're an enterprise, there's, you know, obviously the enterprise E3, uh, Office Apps plus Cloud Services. So there's Pro Plus and there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, and then there's Enterprise E1, right? So there's Enterprise E1, Enterprise E3, and Pro Plus. Um, and what's great about uh, the enterprise side is that's where kind of fast track comes into play. Uh, but again, you know, I like to show this just so we're all on the same page on, you know, how do I get office uh, and how does this play into um, my strategy if I am on premise today, right? And that's what we're gonna really focus on today is, is what, do we, what do we do to get you cut over from being on premise to uh, the O365 stack? Um, now, you know, a lot of you mentioned, hey, I am exchange, hybrid, et cetera, but there's a lot of great add-ons that you can um, put, pull into the, uh, Six, uh, the O365 and 365 stack, and we'll address that in a second. Um, so here's the big eye chart, uh, I like to call it. And you can see that, you know, on one side you get your business, on the other side you got your enterprise. And again, there, the Pro Plus is kind of like, you know, hey, I'm gonna keep my exchange on, on premise for now, and I just need Pro Plus, that's it, right? Um, and we're gonna address that in a second. Uh, the middle option is the other way. Hey, I have, I pay for my apps, um, I just want exchange online. And then the, the E3 is the full kit and caboodle, everything's included. And you know, you obviously you're paying for that, but what's be the benefit of this is, hey, one management plane, you know, everything's simplified. I don't know, for those who use it, we use it every day. Uh, and I'm telling you right now, it's easy. It just works, right? Um, and there's no upgrade to worry about. There's no, hey, when's the next version of Office coming out? It's just upgraded. And that's what's great about it, the on, on the fly installs, right? Um, so here's just a simple example. I got a ton of examples, uh, but I just wanted to share one simple one, right? So I'm a smaller customer. You know, I'm using, you know, Office 2007, 2010. Heck, I, I interacted with a customer using 2010 a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, oh my God, like I haven't seen 2010 in forever, right? Um, you have mobile devices, et cetera. What is your options, right? So this, this is a great fit for someone who's, hey, I, I just wanna go business, right? And I'm gonna pay $8 per user per month, you know, 825, and I'm gonna get everything that's on the screen here today, right? Now, I can also add on email. Um, so I can move to email and, and just do email and keep my investment on premise or I can go full end to end and go pro plus. So there's a lot of different ways you can um, slice and dice what you get and how you get it. Um, and so really, if you want to have a licensing conversation, reach out. Uh, we can take you through that. Trevor, who's, who runs our managed service provider, does a great job at explaining the best options for you. I, just, I actually sat on a call with him recently for a customer we work with, and he was able to kind of explain end to end, you know, hey, here's how it works, here's how we're gonna cut you over, uh, et cetera, and we were able to, you know, move them from an on-premises install to a whole end to end Office 365. Um, now, let's talk about Exchange. So you get what's called Exchange Online, and, you know, you can do up to 50 gigabit inbox with your custom domain, you can access it from almost any device, uh, and yeah, you get the benefit of some of the, the protection, right? Um, and then you can add a terabyte of storage, that's business essentials. Um, 
Uh, so you can do full board just exchange online, or you can go and do the packages, right? And that's what if you're if you're a enterprise, you know, and again, if you just want to go exchange online, you can, but you can also go to the two packages here, um, and you can add on services on above and beyond just doing exchange online right so that begs the question and i'm going to open up the, the phone to andy and jody you know what is the future of microsoft exchange server so you know back to that question we asked earlier is exchange 2019 the last on-premises version and you know andy we were talking about this before so curious to yeah. get some insight from you guys on that Yep. Uh, thanks, Pete. So I'll I'll uh, I'll get to that. But when we're talking about the future of Microsoft Exchange Server, I think it's it's kind of good to just do a quick review of well, kind of what's now uh, and a few important dates around that. Obviously, for those that are already in Exchange Online or um, in hybrid mode, know that uh, as of October 13th of this year, so we got a little less, well, a little more than two months. Exchange 2010 uh, will be end of life from even extended support. So completely unsupported. So that's been a date that a lot of organizations have been have been racing against. If you're on Exchange 2010, uh, we've been doing uh, we've been doing a lot of migrations and of course more maybe more recently a, a ton of migrations forced by that that date coming up because it's the uh, no more support after that at all. Um, for Exchange Server 2013, um, the end of mainstream support, which means that features are added, things like that, was actually back in 2018. But uh, extended support for 2013 goes through April of 2023. So you have a few more years on that. And then Exchange Server 2016 um, actually ends mainstream support and again, that's feature updates, additions, uh, that ends October of this year as well. But extended support goes through October of 2025. And then that takes us to Exchange Server 2019, the potential candidate for the last on-prem version of Exchange. Um, and I know we did the poll earlier, it's, it's fairly split. Um, I think that's probably from the uh, the audience's uh, experience with Microsoft over the years. Um, I find it interesting when I um, will do some searches or check in to see what Microsoft, when they're asked the question directly, like, will Exchange Server 20, uh, sorry, 2019 be the last version? Um, or that somebody's heard that, the response is, there's been no formal statement. And whoever's saying that is speculation. <laughs> So, well. so we still, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So we still don't know for sure, um, but we do know that they'll still be adding features to Exchange Server 2019. So mainstream support goes through January of 2024. So a few more years on that, and then extended support ends um, actually the same the same day. Uh, same date for 2016, which is October of 2025. Okay, so um, I'm sure you remembered all those dates and numbers that I just spit out. I always have to refer to a chart on that, <laughs> to, uh, to be honest. Um, as far as whether it'll be, so here's here's my take on whether it will be the last um, on-prem version or um, or what are the decision points around that. Um, I think kind of an overarching piece is that in the past, since Microsoft released, uh, you know, since since before it was Microsoft 365 and more recently Office 365, and then before that, uh, BPOS, or if everybody remem remembers the acronym Business Productivity Office uh, Online Suite, <clears throat> I actually forget that from time to time. Um, in the past, on-prem has been leading the feature set for what's available up in the cloud. We've already kind of passed the inflection point where 2019, Exchange Server 2019, um, is being supported to be in parity, more or less, with what's available with Exchange Online, 
but still not, not quite. So actually in the past, on-prem was leading what was available in Exchange Online. Now that's actually flipped where 2019 has just actually released some features that have been available up in Exchange Online. So uh, one specifically is around uh, e-discovery. So now you actually, you know, a new feature, something that you've been able to do in Exchange Online is e-discovery searches. You can now do that um, across mailboxes and public folders um, in Exchange 2019. Other things for uh, Exchange 2019 are around just, you know, as one would expect, uh, more horsepower can support more CPUs, more RAM. Um, you can deploy it on server core. So from a footprint or security aspect, um, server core might be a fit for that. Um, one other thing to note, or another thing to note is the unified messaging role or the UM role has been removed in 2019. So if you actually leverage that for integration with your phone system voicemail, <clears throat> um, it still exists in 2016, but not in 2019. So this is now where we see the on-prem functionality being deprecated, more of a move towards you know, Exchange Online and integrations with, uh, with the cloud services. <clears throat> Um, searches, searching has been improved. So for those of you that have struggled with, uh, you know, search indexes getting corrupted and whatnot in 2019, that's actually been moved to uh, individual mailboxes. It's stored there. So with the idea of it being um, quicker as well as hopefully less uh, apt to, uh, to corrupt or run into any issues with that. And then they've also added uh, client access rules. Essentially, we'll say conditional access light for Exchange 2019 on-prem. Those are kind of the, um, I'll say the new pieces in 2019, but all of those have been available in Exchange Online. So that, while it's not a straight answer saying like, hey, yeah, this is gonna be the last version, there's a lot of indications and uh, you know development and um, support resource movements towards that, and so that's my it depends answer. <laughs> yeah, and I'll uh, I got a question for later. I think that will play into the why, right? Why why should you be looking at O365 M365, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll we'll cover that in a little bit. So yeah, that's a great answer. So there's no yes or no is what I'm hearing. <laughs> Um, not, not not yet not not definitively yeah. yet yeah and, and again you you got three guys who are pretty pretty opinionated here and, and, uh, <laughs> and it's kind of funny that you know even we can't say yes or no um all right so let's talk through uh you know what is uh uh you know fast track uh but before we do oh, i just lost my slides uh before we do, you know, from Jody, what, what do you think the number one driver to move into Office 365 is? So what do you think, you know, if, if anybody on the call today, for those who answered no or no, it's not on my radar, why should they consider M slash O365? Yeah, so Andy, I can kick that off. I, I, okay. I think, you know, look, the answer, the, the, the true consulting answer is it, it depends, but what I, I'll, I'll give lots more context there. So it depends on the organization, right? Uh, and, and it depends on first the size of the organization and then two, sort of the maturity of the, or, of the organization. And, and from a sizing perspective, look, if you look at the SMB space, um, typically the driver there is uh, lack of support internally, right? Um, trying to support an on-prem exchange environment for, for a small business is, is challenging in a lot of different ways. And so to get that, that sort of IT overhead off of their plate, and let somebody else worry about it. That's a primary driver we see in the SMB space. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you get into large organizations, um, you know, like particularly in the mid market, it, that becomes a much more strategic discussion in the sense that it, the, the, it's the old adage of how do we do more with less, right? And and Office 365 has matured so significantly over the last few years, in particular. Um, now with you know literally hundreds of thousands, millions of mailboxes 
um, that has changed significantly. So those organizations are looking at it more from either a very tactical approach, meaning, hey, I, I don't really have a true exchange admin that knows all the notes, nuts and bolts, or if I do, I've got much more important things that I'd like that individual or a group of individuals working on, all the way to um, much more strategic and mature approaches in the sense of, how do we, how, what can we do as an organization around collaboration and productivity suites that we already own to make our users more productive, doing more with less, not only from an IT perspective, but a pure business user perspective. That, that is something we see more and more of, and a lot of our engagements um, focus in that area. So again depends on the organization depends on the size of the organization it depends on the maturity but those are the two primary drivers that i see cool anything you want to add to that yeah i, I think i'll actually go to kind of the the more tactical <clears throat> aspects of it um and probably what i've what i've heard and seen more recently from customers who are uh now you know looking to move in the process of moving is that there's so many other things uh, going on in, in IT, so many other things to manage to focus on. Like when it comes down to it, this is email. It's been around for a long time. And it's, it's kind of always been that part of the infrastructure that's never been mission critical until something happens to it. Always kind of fallen into the business critical piece. So we're, we're kind of now at the point where it's like, hey, I, I just want my email taken care of. It's, you know, it's, it's email. And now that there's more confidence and trust in locating that up in up in the cloud, and there are a lot of security options around um, Microsoft 365 tenants. Um, I think as as Pete had on a slide, the uptime uh, guarantee is three nines, which basically gives you just less than nine hours of downtime per year, which is pretty good. So I think it's now at the point where a lot of organizations are saying, yeah, put it up there. You know, we're ready for that. We've had Gmail accounts for years. We've, you know, we've had cloud email personally. Now it's just kind of falling in line with that. So it's just kind of getting it off their plate and having it run as a service instead of another part of the infrastructure to manage. Nice. Yeah, I agree. Cool. So let's talk fast track now. So, you know, what is fast track? And before we do, let's dive into a couple of fun conversation, Andy, and, and, you know, we look at kind of our customers, right? Every customer goes through a cycle on getting any product deployed, but let's, you know, we're going to keep it strictly to Office uh, 365 and 365. And really, you know, the goal here is, you know, how do you plan and onboard the, the customer? But then more importantly, you know, how do you get the adoption rates, and, you know, managed and then continue to enhance the offering over time? And that's where Microsoft is really focused on. So, yeah, it's one thing to sign up for the the O365, but it's another thing to actually adopt it, use it, manage it, and actually continue to, you know, gain benefit from the features that are within the stack. And, you know, if I were going to summarize, I'd say that's the benefit of the fast track program is it's going to help customers really get through this life cycle um, and, you know, and really focus on, you know, how do I get the customer's satisfaction to stay consistent throughout the process? Um, you know, I don't know about you, but, yeah, you get all excited when you're like, yeah, we're going to we're going to adopt the product and we're going to go and roll it out. And then we get to that that point where we're like, oh, man, are we ever going to are we ever going to use it? You know, and, and that's really where, you know, I think fast track plays into it. So um, so, you know, really quickly, um, you know, if you can talk through some of the the dot, the, the in, you know, fast track options and then and then I'll, I'll put up a summary slide. But, you know, what you know, what's the benefit of fast track for customers and then what's the sizing recommendations and et cetera. You know, I know there's some, you know, probably I don't say misinformation out there, but you know, how big of an organization can benefit from fast track? And then what are the options if, if you're not meeting that threshold? Yeah, great question, Pete. So, so look, let me do a little level setting on fast track. N number one, there is a tremendous amount of misinformation and disinformation around fast track. Uh, and it's, and it's primarily for, for sort of two reasons. One, just to be totally transparent, I think from a Microsoft field account perspective, many of those account reps are hesitant to talk about fast track, um, particularly when they're driving 
uh, enterprise agreement deals. It, it can it can side it can it can help a conversation go a little bit sideways off the track and off the focus of getting an enterprise agreement signed. Um, honestly, a lot of folks, uh, account reps at, at at Microsoft, aren't all that familiar with fast track. On the partner side, partners are generally speaking very uh, unfamiliar with fast track. And so one of the common misnomers that we run into working only through partners, like we talk to partners all day, every day. And what I consistently find is those partners, most of them are not familiar with fast track. They are misinformed in the sense that they think it's going to take business away from them. And so therefore they are afraid of it and they won't talk much about it. And the third is there's only a handful of fast track ready partners authorized by Microsoft globally, right? And when I say a handful, there's globally, there's about 185, I believe at the moment. Um, and, and so there's, there's limited number of partners that are able to deliver that on behalf of fast track. So for all those reasons, there's a lot of disinformation. One of the common things that people think fast track is, fast track is, is free migration to office 365. And while there's truth to that, there's the devils in the details. So, so first and foremost, if you are a customer that has 150 plus seats of Office 365, you are absolutely entitled to fast track. There are a couple of, of exceptions like nonprofit licensing and education licensing may not be, uh, it may not be available to them. But generally speaking across the commercial space, if you're 150 users or above, you are entitled to one of two aspects of fast track and that's the onboarding. So onboarding is the best way to think about that is strategic guidance around how best your organization can adopt Office 365. So we're going to do things working in, a, in regular, consistent phone based consulting with you and your team. We're going to help you under, help. We're going to first understand where you're at from an infrastructure and in, in, in application delivery perspective, where your core, your organization currently sits, and then translate that into, okay, here are the challenges, roadblocks that are in the way that need to be removed in order to make your adoption of Office 365 effective. We're going to help you with that, help you understand that. We're then going to point you in all the directions to best practices. We're going to pull white papers that are appropriate to you. We're going to do all that research and, and guide you down that path. Um, think of it as phone a friend, right? You are ultimately responsible as the customer for driving that adoption and driving that planning, but we're going to guide you every step of the way based on all of our experience. Um, so that, that's the first aspect, the first benefit of Fast Track. And again, 150 seats or above. What most people understand Fast Track to mean is free migration. And, and that's when I said that that's true, but the devil's in the details. If you are licensed for 500 or more Office 365 licenses, then you're actually entitled to the physical migration piece. In other words, taking a mailbox from Exchange On-Prem or another solution into uh, Exchange Online, Microsoft will absolutely do that part for free. Um, and, and they do that through a number of uh, global data center. We, I look at them as production warehouses, and that's how you should think about them. It is a, it is a manufacturing warehouse, uh, very valuable, but they are going to take what you provide to them and move that directly to Office 365. If there is a problem with that, they don't troubleshoot. They just kick it back. So when properly planned and used in the first benefit of Fast Track appropriately uh, applied and managed than those that are eligible for the free migration, it is quite valuable, but it does need to be managed effectively. So choosing the fast track partner is, is really important. Cool. That's a great insight. So, so Jody, uh, you know, as far as fast track goes, uh, you know, what's the best way a customer if they qualify can, can gain access to fast track, you know, obviously they can work with Zentagra, uh, we can help broker it, but they can also reach out to their rep as well and say, hey, I'm interested in Fast Track and I want to work with Zentegra and, you know, via, you know, in Centra, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. That's the best way. You, you can actually log on to your Office 365 online portal as the admin and you can request that service uh, via your portal directly. You can also reach out to your Microsoft account rep if you have one uh, and, and ask them to do that. Um, if you request this is important because like i said not all fast track partners are created equal we run into a lot of customers 
that have a fast track partner, um, but they, they're not really seeing the value out of it. And if that's the case, please trust me in the sense that that is not a program problem. That is a partner problem. Um, the program is quite valuable when managed effectively. And we work really closely with the global Microsoft team that's responsible for managing fast track. Being one of the original six, we have, uh, we, we have by far the most experience uh, and we have had the most success. So Microsoft uses us internally when recruiting and looking at other fast track partners as a really good example of not how to be successful for us, but as a really good example of how this program can add value to customers. And that's the whole point, right? So, so you can request it online, but please be aware that when you do that, there is an automated mechanism within Microsoft. They automated this process, process entirely about 18 months ago. That means nobody looks at it. They look at you, they look at your account, they look at your reg where you're located regionally, and they just assign you automatically to a fast track partner. So my suggestion is uh, that if you are interested in those benefits, that you reach out to Zintegra or to us directly, and, and we can get you into the fast track program. Um, at, 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 at the very least, if you have a Microsoft account rep, talk to them. A lot of you uh, may be already Zintegra uh, CSP customers. Uh, absolutely reach out to your Zintegra rep. And worst case scenario, you can, you can reach out to Pete here and he can hook you up with the right people between Zintegra and Zintra. Nice. And um, just one other comment I'd like to make, and it's not known because it's, you know, everybody thinks, they think 0365, right? In part of fast track, and you know, I just want to make sure I'm not going to overstep here, but is also you know Azure AD, right? So you know, part of this Absolutely. is if you're going to be successful with O365, you have to be successful with Azure AD, isn't? So Azure AD is a component as well, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So, so basically, every aspect of Microsoft 365 has a fast track benefit associated with it. If you are paying for the licenses, you are entitled to that benefit. Uh, Azure AD. Look, one of the first things that we go into. So, so if you look at the first part, the first benefit of fast track being the onboarding experience. Um, one of the things that will really drive is identity management. Um, identity management is absolutely critical, not only from a security perspective and a 0365 perspective, but a tenant perspective, right? What you do initially in your 0365 and Azure tenants with regards to identity sets the foundation for everything else that you do. So, so that's a key component that will really drive. It's something you want to get right from the beginning because it can be painful down the road to have to go back and rework some of that identity. And, and you will always have to do that. Because, of course, security is always going to be a concern, whether you're on-prem or in the cloud. Um, but, uh, but you want to have that right and be ready to adjust to new requirements and new features and new solutions as things go on. And having that identity uh, platform nailed down in the beginning uh, is, 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 is crucial. Yeah, and then, you know, and then I always say to my customers when I'm working with them, especially in Azure realm, you know, the Azure AD is one of those key pieces that, you got to get it right and everything else will just fall into place. And yep. part of O365 is making sure that Azure AD is up to snuff and, and ready to go. So uh, it makes life easier from an SSO point of view as well, um, just yep. from experience and, and working with customers. Cool. So let's talk about the final piece of fast track and it always comes up. What about data migration? So what about, you know, mailbox migrations and PST files? How does that fit into fast track and what's your recommendations? And, yeah, you know, I know. I know there's a lot of great solutions out there. We can't obviously sit here and make recommendations about solutions, but we can talk about what we can do to help the customers. Yeah, I'll take the first part and then hand over to Andy. He has a lot more technical information, probably a lot more valuable to everybody here. But just from a high level, one of the things we typically run into, two, two things we typically run into that are challenging for organizations when we talk about migrating mail. Um, primary mail is, is fairly straightforward. Um, when you talk about user experience, it's something you definitely want to focus on, and, and we can drive a lot of that and help with a lot of that. However, the two things that come up in addition to that are email archives. Um, if you have an email archive solution in place today, um, it, it is definitely something you want to address, uh, meaning and discuss and determine the path forward as at the same time you're discussing a primary mail migration. And the reason I say that is because it ha can have a significant impact in two areas. One, um, uh, cost, certainly. 
uh, cost and ROI. So if you have in a enterprise vault or source one or solutions like that, where you have large mail mar archives, a lot of partners are, aren't familiar with email archives and they won't necessarily talk to you about what's your best option to get that into Office 365. And you're leaving a lot of, you're leaving a lot of cost savings on the table if you're not having that discussion. The second piece is user experience absolutely critical. The last thing you want to do when you're migrating any application uh, for, for end users is create a situation that, that is frustrating for them. And if our email archives aren't addressed properly, it can easily create uh, confusion and frustration for them. And then the second is PSTs. What are we going to do with our PSTs? Do we need to do anything with our PSTs? If so, how do we do that? Um, those are the key, two key components that often come up. Uh, and, and so that's just very high level. I'll, I'll hand to Andy as, as he deals with this a lot more than I do on a daily basis. Yeah, thanks, Jody. Um, <clears throat> uh, those are absolutely some um, some items that need to be uh, thought through before uh, migrations are done. And, and I say that just because we've uh, we take a very um, uh, stepwise and methodical approach to doing migrations. We've done hundreds of them, uh, but over the course of that, we've come up with an approach that gives us a uh, customized way per organization because it's it's different for everyone. So that means starting off with um, actually establishing what the goals need to be for the migration, not just hey let's uh, let's put Exchange and Hybrid and then start moving mailboxes and see what happens. Um, that's how a lot of uh, a lot of projects start. Um, also, where a lot of uh, uh, <laughs> projects that we've been brought into, uh, once uh, it kind of gets going, but then realize there's a bit more to it. But we want to make sure to establish the uh, the goals of the migration, and then assess the impact to the business. How you know what is what is email being used for? It's not just email anymore is the, are there integrations with other applications are there business workflows um you know what's the what are the uptime requirements um how much mail you know how much how much data is there um and how long is it going to take to actually to migrate what's the effect going to be how do we actually group mailboxes in a way for migration so that we don't impact um mailbox delegate permissions, things like that, that uh, you tend not to find out until you do that, and then things seem to be broken. Um, but it's just those items that need to be planned and put into a design and a migration plan, which is what we do um, to make sure that it's, everyone understands the, the what's gonna be done, how it's gonna be done, and why it's gonna be done, and then move into testing first, without affecting any live mail, um, validating the assessment and assumptions, updating them if needed, uh, moving into a pilot once those are uh, remediated, um, and then from the pilot, scheduling out the production migrations with the whole goal being that you do the planning and the testing up front so that the actual production migration is a non-issue. So I, I usually kind of call that the 80-20 rule. 80% uh, planning, designing, and testing. And then the last 20% should just be, oh, okay, everything moved. And you already ran into the issues, could already address them. Um, and then, you know, per um, some of the slides that Pete had up uh, earlier, the adoption and management, which is then how to increase the adoption once you're in Exchange Online and most likely, um, the Microsoft 365 suite, how do you start adopting and using more of that? Um, the goal might be to just move your mail up there, but ultimately you wanna take more advantage of those licenses that you're paying for and making sure that um, your staff and your users um, know how to use it. And it isn't just from sending out a sheet of saying, hey, here's how you use OneDrive, here's how you use SharePoint, um, but actually helping them adapt uh, I should say, adapt to those new technologies and take advantage of the collaboration that's now available. 
Yeah, yeah. That, that's a really good point, Andy. Um, that that is something that's often missed. Uh, these projects oftentimes are are managed and looked at entirely by IT and focused on a technical discussion around literally getting mail from one place to the other and changing operations around the support of that. Um, we often find uh, that, that organizations are are not really focusing on adoption and change management, or if they are, they're really struggling with the, with with good results of that adoption and change management. And that's something we can help with through the Fast Track program as well. So a lot of new technologies available and solutions available uh, that are having significantly higher productivity adoption rates than previous uh, than in the than in the past. Yep. Yeah, so um, a great question came in, and I, I saved it for this this point. So Jeff asked, um, does this mean with Exchange 2019 and a shared desktop environment, there'll be no need for FS Logix or Search Index? Um, so, you know, Andy, I, I'm going to say that the answer still is no, because, you know, FS Logix obviously has a lot of great value, but, you know, the uh, OST or, yeah, OST file still gets created even if your Exchange uh, you know, on-premise, correct? Um, so you still can still gain benefit from using Microsoft FS Logics with, uh, you know, in a shared environment. Uh, uh, yeah, I would I would agree. Well, I mean, so typically, if you have, <clears throat> um, if you're still on-prem with your Exchange server running Exchange in online mode, um, could be sufficient. And I say could be because it depends on your topology. Yep. Um, you might not need FS Logics for that if you're close to your data center. I mean, kind of the same rules apply. Um, but if you're in satellite offices or just not near your data center where your latency jumps even a couple milliseconds, then it's usually the right way to go. Um, and it's also, you know, part of the Microsoft stack now. Yeah, nice. All right. So any uh, questions uh, that come to mind as we're wrapping up, uh, please, please put them in the Q&A dialogue. Uh, great question. So uh, just really quickly, uh, you know, Incentra and Zentegra, you know, how do we fit together? Uh, and I love working with Incentra, but Jody kind of summed it up nicely. Uh, Incentra, you guys were well, one of the first uh, six fast track partners in the world. And I love always putting the stat out there. You guys are one of the top gold partners that actually do not transact. Is that a fair statement, Jody? And can you just comment on, you know, how does Zentegra and Incentra work together? Um, and it's pretty transparent to the end user once we engage, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So first thing around Microsoft, anybody who knows anything about how Microsoft actually judges their partners, this is a pretty interesting tidbit. Um, it, to my knowledge, we're still the only gold certified partner globally that's never sold a single Microsoft uh, license or consumed any uh, partner of record, meaning getting paid by Microsoft for the consumption that a customer may have. And that's because we're 100% channel focused. So that's a feat in and of itself and recognition by Microsoft of the value we provide to the partner community and ultimately to customers. Um, so, so with regards to Zintegra, look, because we operate only through partners, um, we, we limit that avail our, our availability to those partners. We look for partners that are, are strategic in nature with us and focused philosophically on one thing um, because our entire executive team, including myself, came from years on the client side. So we were in roles that many of you on the, in the audience are in today. Myself, I was an engineer way back in the day, uh, but, but I spent 10 years plus as a CIO in different industries. So, so we, have, we, we, we started this business primarily to help partners actually add more value to you as the customer. So we're very particular about who we operate with. Uh, and, and again, the, the primary uh, factor there is philosophic, philosophic in nature. What does a partner ultimately want to want to provide? What what is their mission? And Zintegra matches up perfectly with us because their stated mission is actually adding more value to customers. And you can see you can see that by nature of like this webinar and all the weekly webinars that Pete drives. That's what that's all about. Um, so what does that ultimately mean to you as a customer? Well, you work with Zintegra. Your primary relationship is with, is with Zintegra. All your transactions are with Zintegra. So you don't have to do anything different from an onboarding perspective. You don't have to onboard another vendor uh, separately as Incentra. We're gonna work directly with you. 
we're transparent about uh, who we are. So, you know, we're not white labeling. Um, you'll see in Century email addresses and Zintegra email addresses, and we're really strategically aligned, not only from an overall value perspective, but on individual opportunities, we're really strategically aligned in the background and tactically aligned. So we work hand in hand with Zintegra architects, project managers, as they do with our architects and project managers. Cool. And um, yeah, it's been a great relationship. And uh, but the reality here is who is Integra? It's simple. Uh, you know, we can we can sell you a lot of the solutions that are on our partner webpage. page. Uh, we can also work with you on enabling fast track. Uh, but more importantly, as Jody alluded to, we always try to look to add value. So we don't want you just to buy something, let it sit on a shelf and go to waste. So we're always going to be working with you as a customer as a customer to become very strategic. And, you know, even if it's just the EUC aspects of your business, the end user compute aspects of your business. So, again, we, we you know, we're your classical value added reseller, but Andy built this, this, uh, this company, Andy Whiteside, our CEO and founder, on the notion of enabling our customers and adding true value to not only our clients, but our, our partners as well. Um, and the great thing is we are a Citrix service provider partner, but more importantly, we're a Microsoft Gold in a Microsoft Cloud Solutions provider. So uh, what does that mean? That means that, you know, eventually, you know, you could talk to Trevor who, who runs our, what's called Zentegra Connect business, uh, and that's uh, our managed service provider division. And, you know, let's face it, we've all been here, done that, right? I, I personally, like Jody said, I was in IT at one point in my life. I remember, you know, have, being on call and getting phone calls from Europe and Asia uh, and being the on-call guy. Uh, I was working in a biotech company at the time and nothing stinks more than getting your weekend disrupted your evening disrupted and why not why not defer that to somebody else so you know Zentegra offers a full managed service stack uh, on top of Microsoft Azure on Office 365 on top of Citrix uh, so that's something to think about as you start looking at you know why to work with Zentegra but more importantly why to work with Zentegra and Incentra um, so here's a, a bunch of the offerings that we have and you can see we have a wide breadth of offerings and Behind this is also the supportability of these offerings. So if we take you on as a customer, we're going to support you as well from an L2, L3 point of view. Um, and in depth, we do also have a hosted services option as well. Um, and more importantly, we can build solutions on top of Azure, on top of on top of O365. But you can see we have a wide breadth of options when it comes to uh, building out hosted solutions for you, the customer. Um, and then finally, here's our more nitty gritty, you know, what I call uh, a la carte services as well. And, you know, you can see on here, yes, we are a Microsoft cloud service provider. Uh, so we can sell you CSP licensing. We can sell you Office 365 licensing. And I highly suggest you get on the phone with Trevor to understand, you know, what are you spending? How are you spending it? And then finally, we can offer Centra a, back as, uh, a backup as a service offering as well which plays into that whole data migration. So you can see wide breadth of uh, solutions here. Um, and then finally, just the end cap here, are you hiring? So if, you're in, if you are hiring or you got open positions in your company, definitely point your, your targeted persons, your HR, et cetera, to us. We have a full staffing division. Uh, we can help you guys find the right person uh, for the right job. And more importantly, we vet them pretty heavily. Yours truly can sometimes get on the phone and do the interview. Um, before they even hit your desk, they're, they've been pretty vetted. Uh, so, so that's something to think about. That's a new aspect of our business uh, that we are growing. And then finally, we do a lot of what's called assessments. And I highly recommend take me up on my offer when I do the follow-up emails to sit down with Trevor and team to go through, you know, hey, how do I engage Fast Track? How do I figure out, does this program fit for me? Am I spending the money in the right places when it comes to licensing? So we'll sit down and take that 30-minute consult call and we'll work with you to not only assess your spend, but even go deeper and assess your EUC investment. So your VMware investment, your Citrix investment, we have full uh, what we call micro assessment services that we offer that are all free. Uh, so definitely check those out. Um, so with that, you know, final call to action and final call for any question and answer, um, you know, please, you know, definitely reach out. If you want to dig deeper, take an extra time with us. We'll sit down with you. We'll help you understand you know, what is fast track? How do you, can you, you engage it? If you're in the middle of fast track and you're just not feeling like you're getting the best service, reach out. Uh, we might, we, 
trip and replace and become the partner, but we can at least give you some food for thought. Um, and most of the time, when I, it's funny, I, you know, I'd say all leads, all roads lead to Incentra in one way or another, because I, I've been involved with a few where there's another partner involved, but Incentra is behind the scenes. And we're, no, we're not gonna try to rip that other partner out, but we'll give you some good food for thought. Um, so I'll do one final call for any questions. Uh, and with that, I'm going to also say any final thoughts, Jody, on your side uh, about Fast Track or just in general. Yeah, I would just say with regards to Fast Track, if you if you are trying to take advantage of those benefits, or someone on your team may be working with it and and they're not seeing value, you know, have a conversation with that partner first. Um, dive into that. It is a very valuable benefit that you are entitled to. Um, if you're not getting that value, talk to the partner that's delivering it for you. Uh, and and try to resolve that. If you're not happy with that, then reach out to to the Zintegra team and and get associated with our fast track queue because we 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 do this a lot. Um, we've got 600 customers in our queue that we work with, and uh, and as I said, we have a lot of success and success defined as actually helping you, the customer, adopt and overcome the challenges that you need to overcome in order to adopt. Sweet. And then finally, Andy, any final thoughts or inputs on fast track or anything for that matter you're, you're one of the smartest guys i know <laughs> uh i think just you know encourage i just like to encourage everybody to reach out and ask questions um every uh every environment is different um there's there's different challenges both technically and um you know and from a from a business perspective we're we're always happy to just um a answer questions share the experience that we have or you know see if uh see if it's something that we can help out with. Sweet. All right, with that, I'm gonna say thank you, uh, Andy and Jody, for joining me this week. Uh, Jody, two time, two weeks in a row, man, I love it. Uh, and uh, thanks everybody for joining another edition of uh, Zentegra's Webinar Wednesday, and hope to see everybody next week. If you're new, we run these every week at 11 o'clock. We feature a different vendor or topic every week, and hopefully you found this uh, insightful and enjoyed it. So hope to see new folks again, and for those returning, thanks for returning. And hope to see you again next week. And uh, have a great day, everybody. And as I always see, say, see you guys on the flip side. Thanks, all. Make it a great day. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Pete.